Hello. This is the Fight Back Podcast, hosted by exercise scientist Georgia Very. Here, you'll find a series of honest conversations about martial arts and mental health. My guests and I explore the statement that every martial artist has heard. Martial arts saved me. How and why do combat sports save people? Listen to find out. This episode is sponsored by Safety, a violence prevention app that could save your life. Now, I want to be very clear that no app is a silver bullet and in a violent situation, you might freeze, your nervous system might take over, or you might really love your attacker and not feel like you could push a panic button. There are many types of responses that you might have when experiencing violence. However, you want to have the option to be able to panic if you need to. And what do I mean by that? So the safety app has a panic button that you can press and it will immediately start taking photos of your selfie camera and your back camera, collect your GPS and audio and send that data to three emergency contacts. To download the safety app onto your phone is completely free if you are just using the panic button and you can try out some of their other features for 28 days as well. It's on Apple and Android and the links to do so are in the show notes for this podcast episode. Once again, I want to say a big thank you to our friends at Safety. George, welcome to the Fight Back podcast. Everyone, I am here today with Dr. George Jennings. He is a senior lecturer in sports sociology at Cardiff Metropolitan University in the UK. George, welcome to the Fight Back podcast. Oh, hi. Thanks, Georgia. This is very kind to be introduced and uh, it's great to be on the show. Can you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm um, based in the UK. I'm originally um, from England and I moved around a little bit for work and different purposes. But um, I've done martial arts since I was 14. So I, I started um, because my best friend did taekwondo. And I got into it, really interested in it. And, and from that, interested in fitness and health and well-being and all these kind of topics. And that's led me to study sports science, a sports science degree or sport and exercise sciences degree at the University of Exeter, which is down in the southwest of England. And I really enjoyed that. And I met my supervisor there who eventually became my PhD supervisor because he was also interested in martial arts. Um, and then from there, because I, was, I, I came across a book called um, When the Body Became... Becomes All Eyes, which is by Philip Zerilli, which is about a South Indian martial arts called Kalari Payat. And it's an ethno- it was an ethnographic study. So the ethnog- ethnography is when you get involved in a group for a long period of time and you write mm-hmm. about them, basically, what they do, their okay. practices. And I thought that was really cool. So I did my undergraduate dissertation in using that method, but looking at Wing Chun, which is my main martial arts, um, the one I've practiced the, the longest. And then I continued my studies into my master's, and then I managed to get a PhD scholarship looking at doing Chinese martial arts more broadly and British practitioners' experiences of long-term practice. So this was more of an interview-based life history study. And then from there, I started my first lecturing job. I, I was in London and, and Scotland for one year each, which was very nice experiences. And then I moved to Mexico for five years. It's very nice. It was also a great experience um, in Mexico City. And I came across the Mexican martial arts uh, by, ch- by luck, really. And I managed to do some research, an independent research project of my own um, there. Looking, It's called Shilam. So it means to remove the skin, which is more metaphorical, don't worry. It's more about, in in many ways, it has a kind of a psychotherapeutic element of developing the human being and stripping away kind of external ideas of themselves. And that was really interesting. I started to write up about that. And then there was an opportunity to come back to the UK uh, because there was a job going at Cardiff Met. And I knew some people in the department. um, And I've been... They were there for five years now, so they're back to and now in the way another corner of the UK and Wales. Uh, and at the moment, I'm looking at Tai Chi, so I'm still interested in Chinese martial arts, but also I'm looking at historical European martial arts, which is called HEMA, which is like an acronym, it's quite popular these days. So, historical me- medieval fencing, late medieval period, and early Renaissance. So, it's really good fun. Um, I got it, got a class tonight, and with those two, I'm looking at how it, they're taught often and the role of language, particularly in, in the pedagogy, so the teaching and learning system. And then that's starting, and then I'm starting to be looking at what well, looking at humour actually with a, a colleague at Cardiff Cardiff University, which is another university in the city. Uh, Professor Paul Bowman, who we're both interested in humour and particularly in how it's used in the classes and in the communities that martial artists belong to. 
So th those are the current projects I'm involved with. And I'm also generally very interested in reinvention and reconstruction of martial arts. So how they can be used for different purposes. For example, as we know, therapies or therapy and in therapeutic ways as forms of self-help. So even as self-help books um, and also as you know, commercial opportunities of entrepreneurs. So lots of different avenues that martial arts can be used to change, change people's lives and also add something to society. Basically. What so is it about martial arts that got you so hooked? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I mean, uh, as a kid, I practiced, you know, play sport, like uh, you, know, you learn in physical education. So yeah, I enjoyed playing football with friends. I, you know, my brothers and all these good things, especially in the summertime when the weather's better and you go outside. Mm -hmm. But I think martial arts gave, I think they allowed me to enter a different world and that's, I often explain that. So they allow you to enter the world of perhaps another culture. So I don't know, perhaps an imagined world from a Western perspective, but you know, if so I did Taekwondo, you might start to think about um, kind of ways that Koreans or Asians might be teaching through uh, forms or patterns. So they have a very completely different way of teaching things. Um, they let you look inside yourself as well a lot more. I found that as I, as I was playing sports, I was looking more externally to where the ball was. And, but the martial arts may like, help you focus on your posture, your body, your breathing, um, the grounding, the relationship to the floor. So it allowed me to think about you know, maybe my, my body more and my well-being and health and those kind of things. And also allowed me to think about history and um, lineage and these kind of things of knowledge transmission. So it, it opened my eyes to a new world, really. I think that's, and it, there's so many questions and fascinating things about it. And, and there's so many martial arts in the world as well. It's amazing the variety of how they express a culture. Yeah, so that's probably why. Yeah. If we build upon that then, that yeah. was your experience. And then yeah. there's something we talk about a lot on this show, which is that you often hear in various martial arts that, you know, insert martial arts, so say Taekwondo saved my life or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu saved my life or whatever it might be. This is a common thing that we hear. And I'm always curious to hear different people's opinions about why that might be. Okay. I think a lot of it might be structure and routine um, and the, the variety as well in martial arts. So martial arts generally will give you a certain structure to follow, for maybe, maybe a ritual, um, it may be, for example, a form. So you, usually you, you have to go through the form systematically, or they might ha ask you to break things down very into the basic levels, like by holding postures or, or it might be pad work, whatever it is. There's something that make, makes you feel safe, makes you feel... Um, you know, at ease, really. So things like, like for example, Jung Ju, the PhD student you met, he's looking at this kind of concept of ontological security. So the idea that we feel safe through routines. And um, so martial arts can help people who perhaps um, have uh, other issues in their lives. Um, that gives you a discipline and a focus. And, and discipline is a word used a lot in martial arts. Sometimes they use that people, scholars, uh, you know, researchers, for example, in Aikido, like Tamara Cohn has mentioned that um, discipline is used like an, a thing and also a, a method. It's the way we go about things. We're doing things in a very disciplined manner. Obviously, you don't want to be overly disciplined because you want to strive for a balance of, of not to the extremes of certain values. So I think it gives you the discipline. It gives you routine. And it gives you also a, a great variety of things to do. So there's always something to do in martial arts, I think, that you've already noticed. <laughs> so you might be thinking, okay, I need to work on my car, say in your kickboxing, you know, your cardio, or maybe there's like, actually an issue of flexibility, Maybe you need to work on your defense, um, maybe reflexes. And, and there's always something every day you can think, oh, today I'll, I'll work on this, tomorrow I'll work on this. And, and obviously, if you went down another path in life um, that maybe led to crime or some kind of deviant behavior or something that might damage you as a martial artist, even if you look at it in a selfish way, it wouldn't be very good for your martial arts because um, you might um, have time away from your, your gym or there might be interruption or you might have fear of getting in trouble. Um, those kind of things so I think that will maybe unhealthy eating those things and you think oh, I couldn't have you know I do eat cake and things like that don't worry not but but just a, a balance you know so I enjoy a brownie now and again all those kind of things so the coffee but I know that me I need, and tomorrow I should avoid it just because it might damage my ability to spar tonight you know because I might be out, out of shape or unfit and a struggle especially when I'm training with like it's 20 year old you know <laughs> now I'm 36 <laughs> gotta be able to run around them and <laughs> avoid them so yeah, so that's, that's probably why. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to me. Like, it makes sense, but that structure comes up so often. Like, that's probably the number one most commonly cited thing people will say. And certainly in the research that I conducted, that was often cited as well as something that people lent on. And we seem to have a 
like a lifestyle setup where people are always looking towards going on holiday. You know, they're like, oh, I just can't wait until I don't have structure. But it's mm. interesting how like, as human beings, we go a couple of weeks like that and then we want the structure back again. And that when people are really living a life totally devoid of structure, they really yeah. struggle. Like we, we quite need that. It's fascinating. Yes, definitely. I think it's a constant in our lives because you might, you might often now we move around for work and um, all different reasons, education, etc., relationships and those kind of things. So you, but martial arts could be a constant in your life. So you might move, say, from one city in Australia to another or a town, and but either there will be a kickboxer or a Muay Thai club or Kushin Kai karate club, and you can therefore connect that. And you might they may have to do things slightly differently, but there's a way that you, there's a language they speak that you you speak as well. And there's another thing that people often talk about martial arts a bit like a language that. Mm-hmm. You can you speak maybe someone doesn't speak English or you don't speak uh, Chinese or Japanese etc. But you can train together, you can spar together, you can do shadow boxing side by side, and this is another thing I think is very nice that it's fairly accessible and universal in that way. Yeah, yeah, I love that. For me now, I don't go on holiday just to go and oh. and sit or to sightsee. I go on holiday to go and train at a gym specifically mm. in a certain destination. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a little bit the way that I'm wired, but I love that martial arts affords me that opportunity and you meet people who are locals then from that training yeah. and then you get exposed to the city in a totally different way than you would have were you there purely as a tourist to sightsee. Yeah. Definitely, I can imagine that because, you know, yeah, because normally tourists, you go to the resort, you're, very, you're almost like you, you want distance from the locals. It's almost like you're with fellow tourists, but here you're probably one of the only tourists or the only outsiders in the play hall unless it's a training camp where lots of foreigners go and they obviously give you they respect your the work you put in it's almost like they, you put in the hours you put in the years of training for your body and now we're going to give you something a bit more and i think that does happen with visiting martial artists that they get a lot of respect absolutely yeah a lot of your research that I have read talks about the dark side and the light side to oh, martial yeah. arts. And I love having people like you on the podcast because I think when I myself, and I have a sports science degree, but when I try and read through these papers, they can be quite um, at like an academic level. You know, they're not just a casual read. You've got to quite sit down and pick them apart. So I'd love to have you explain in lay terms what that means and some examples that we can think about in terms of the light side of martial arts and the dark side of martial arts. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I used that. Um, I think it's one book chapter in from a, it stems from a coaching conference. And I thought, what can I talk about? terms of pedagogy to make it a bit related to pedagogy so how people teach and learn martial arts and I, I've become increasingly interested in health uh, over the last few years already because I've written a bit about health philosophies and health narratives so people how people tell stories about well-being and health and I thought well what about the practices the things we do so the things we do in martial arts might be the you know small as where we stand where we punch where you, you know, do a kick or an elbow technique or a block so there's so many techniques in martial arts often the training is built around technique and the way you do it might be hitting a pad, it might be hitting a bag, or even a human being, or you know, using conditioning the knuckles on the ground. And the idea of the light and the dark side is that well, you know, it can be great for health and well-being. You think about the variety of techniques we have is imp- impressive because we can use all the all, all different m- movements in front of us and top you know, arms above, using the ground and the floor. But they, also there could be a, a, a darker side in the sense that perhaps either an excessive specialization of movement. So you you know, like many sports. You know, you're over specializing, damaging your elbow, like in tennis or something like that. So perhaps you're you're not not balancing the body, or it might be you might be abusing the body in the sense of creating damage through overly doing certain practices, not balancing certain practices. So maybe too much sparring, for example, and maybe not very obviously good for your brain or your hands or those kind of things. So you know, you can think, well, take it easy with this thing. There's another thing in your arts where you need to balance out. And of course, there are also, you know, we never know how it's taught, but the teacher might be abusing certain practices and uh, being misinformed because we know that, might, um, say, you, you said you've got a sports science degree, where a lot of martial arts instructors know about the martial arts, but maybe they don't know about health and safety or they don't know about, um, you know, how to train the anatomy or maybe how to train younger people. So they might be advocating certain practices that are really only suitable for adults, but they're not. I remember once one of my taekwondo instructors, he's a very good teacher, but he, I think he was told by someone that you, you should drink, uh, who was a triathlete, you should drink. He drinks um, the bath water amount of water. It sounds excessive anyway. <laughs> but right, he was telling us when I was a teenager, oh, yeah, 
my friend drinks as much water as is in the bath, basically, that kind of volume when what? he's training. And, and then, and then, yeah, and then, yeah, and then one guy next to me is mature, so a mature student, should we say, who's in his forties, or he had a kid himself. He put his hand up. Uh, sorry, sir, but uh, I think that's probably for adults, isn't it? And he's, oh yes, yes. But luckily, that parent intervenes because you know, these kind of stories can spread. And, and the kid, probably quite younger than me, might be like, oh, I should drink more water. Like, and obviously, we know that people can die from excessive hydration, so. I think sometimes martial arts is, I know that was back in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, but I'm sure there's still people around who would like hear a story and it's, oh, you should do this. And and then someone could take up a bad practice, basically. Yeah, so that's, that's why I said crazy. the dark time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so there's a few horror stories. I mean, most of the time I have great, I, most of the time I've been positive. So it's probably why I look to the experiences of long-term practice, because I'm interested in why people continue martial arts. For many, most of the people who continue you have that idea of the discipline, the structure and positive stories. But within that, they, they also have ex been exposed to bad practices as well. Maybe the clubs they left often, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that they had a bit of a nightmare story coming into. Um, so those are the things I think we need to be aware of as well. Not Because um, I think martial artists, that we tend to see everything in the road, slightly rose-tinted lenses. And many, as you said, many people are doing research on the martial arts art, happen to be practitioners. Mm -hmm. And, and I want to keep a balance because there are either are some researchers who are very critical uh, of maybe the you know gender or power and class, social class or whatever it is in martial arts, and others who are often a little bit too positive. And I've since I've strayed more to the positive myself. So I think maybe we need a balance and not to be too negative, but not to be too overly positive, you know, um, because we need to show there are some things we need to work on in martial arts. So. Yeah. For sure. I think yeah. like it really comes down to the club that you're in, the club culture and the teachers a lot of the time. Even if you compare two Taekwondo classes or two kickboxing classes, you know, even though they're the same martial art, they can be so vastly different just depending on that coach's interpretation of what it means to train in that martial art and we see a lot of that where people go from being accomplished fighters and getting to a point of deciding now I'm going to coach and that the credentials don't necessarily lend to you know one to the other what do you think about that and what are some things that coaches can do if they feel that they identify with that, that they have a lot of experience as a fighter, now they're looking to teach, but they don't have the sports science degree or, you know, the background in teaching. Yeah, I think now there are more governing bodies of martial arts, but it's relatively, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but I'd say in Britain, it's very, very much like left to the smaller governing bodies or federations and um, the larger globe, let's just say national federation, like Sport England, Sport Wales and I really have much to do with coach education unless it's within Olympic sports or something that represent their nation, either the devolved nations or the UK as, as a whole. So if you're doing something like Wing Chun or, um, you know, this kind of martial arts or Silat or martial arts where there's not really a global, it's more based on lineage, mm -hmm. based on knowledge. It's, it's many ways luck of, luck of the draw and which, you know, so I've been into different Wing Chun organizations. One tries to associate itself with UK sport. Another one, um, joins maybe groups for insurance purposes. Sometimes um, they're affiliated to a governing body just because they need insurance or they need to, so they're recognized. But in reality, they have nothing to do with that organization. So it really is about the, the teacher, their teacher and their teacher's teacher, and maybe some of the people they trained with before. And often what they, they teach is a combination of all the things they've learned as martial artists. So they might not purely teach uh, Wing Chun or something. They often bring in something else. Mm -hmm. But with that, you know, many of them don't have... Um, not necessarily you have to have a degree or anything by the way so you could be a really good teacher and I've had teachers most of them mine don't have one really what, what my main teacher doesn't have a degree uh, didn't really go to university um, but you've got to probably have a thirst for knowledge I think martial artists generally do have a thirst for knowledge and, but also humility and openness which I think a lot of maybe probably often have to work on a little bit more because there's a sense of pride and, and, and they would get a lot of respect inside their group to show that they're open. But I have seen, uh, encountered martial arts now taking courses in anatomy, physiology, personal training, and other things that could supplement. I think that's becoming more common with the, the new generation of instructors realizing they need need this really. Um, but it's really an unregulated industry, which can which means you can have some really hidden gem, like amazing places where you can learn great things. Um, but at the same time, there's some others that perhaps are doing things that are antiquated practices that we probably know and, and other activities in the gym you would not see happening in a, maybe a commercial 
fitness center they know that that exercise is dangerous to the neck or but these people are still doing it um mm-hmm. so i don't know if there's a quick fire easy answer but unless the country and um, tries to regulate a little bit more and it is happening with some things like um so in the uk there's a simps bar which is a chartered institute for management of sport and physical activity it's a big big long name mm-hmm. and it's trying to regulate certain things like tai chi for health um for good or bad i mean again that's not always positive because they're trying to say that you need this many hours of experience and these kind of things and these things but their expectations of the experience is very limited i think i have more hours tai chi than the kind of some of their instruct i suppose instructor training program but I wouldn't feel comfortable enough to teach Tai Chi yet. I feel like I've got a long way in my journey. Um, and it's that even if you have a sports science degree, you could forget things as well. I have a sports science exercise degree and a master's, but I specialize more in the sociology over time. So really my knowledge of anatomy physiology is quite limited <laughs> and I've forgotten a lot of things. So you might think you need to probably um, sorry, have a regular training updates, I think. So if, if we use the word coach here, which is quite the, in that sense, a Western sporting term, then that, that probably means that we got to go, what comes with that is regular updates. You've got to have maybe levels of instructor one, two, three, four. And many martial arts groups are doing that. So they, they often say like, okay, instructor one, two, three. And with that, you probably have to go on a first aid course. You probably have to go on mm-hmm. this. Um, so we probably could develop toolkits, a lot more training toolkits for coaches, instructors, teachers, whatever they want to call themselves and not make it more open. Oh, as open access as possible, I suppose, because a lot of martial arts groups sadly don't have, earn very much money. Mm. A lot of martial artists, if they're just their full time, they're probably just scrape, we say scraping it really, <laughs> just, mm-hmm. just about surviving with their bills. So you probably need to make something accessible and maybe link from research, link uh, interdisciplinary research from different specialists. I think that's the way forward because I don't think, I, I don't think the national governments are going to be able to help or are interested in changing that anytime soon, I think. Yeah, so I hope that helps, but it's, it's a very comp- good question, very complex topic. For sure. Yeah, and yeah. I would love to see that, that there was toolkits that covered things like training children versus training adults, training women, um, understanding of trauma. Because we know a lot of people do come to martial arts as a type of self-help, um, all sorts of things like that. And I think, I really do think watch this space. I think that things like that are coming. There are a lot of people that are working towards developing those sorts of tools and that as they become more widespread and used, I would like to think that the people who are ignoring those tools and choosing not to try to keep learning uh, will end up with clubs that nobody attends because they've got another club that's also within distance of their house that's reasonable and they find that the culture there is much better and the learning experience is better. So that's what I think is coming for for combat sports and martial arts and I, I do hope that it that it does come as we see the popularity of training in combat sports grows as the the public the publicity of the UFC and you know organizations like that continue to grow so hopefully yeah, I think it's a good point sorry yeah I think in terms of the industry expanding and, and the, in it, the market expanding so there's a lot more in your local even a small town now there probably will be numerous clubs of one martial arts um so lots of karate clubs lots of aikido and so if you have one bad experience in one there's always another and now with google and, uh, and the r- reviews and things you mm-hmm. can easily put things out and so the instructors know that they can be can name and, and shamed or have a bad review and they also much like a restaurant you want to present <laughs> the best possible experience and, totally. so, and they, yeah exactly yeah and, and also the customer the student often has more knowledge sometimes now because we, there's a lot of interest in health and fitness and and studying these things so people can't really take for granted that they know more than their students about things yeah for sure what about using martial arts in a therapeutic sense then i know you've been involved with an organization called fighting in spirit what is fighting in spirit and what are you guys okay, doing sure. oh, yeah, thanks yeah so fighting in spirit is written deliberately as one word um, and it was created by stephen thomas so he once he correct when i Creative presentation, and he pointed out, no, George, it's, it's one word, and this is because it's, it's, it sets up the concept that fight the, the spirits together, and it's a non kind of binary, non dualistic way of thinking about the mind and body, and uh, you know, martial arts and therapy as separate entities, but they're the things that, that come together. So he created this some years ago as an in, interest in them really working with gay men. He himself is a gay man and a psychotherapist, and he said that um, his experience that 
gay men often see touch as uh, sexual hypersexualized or mm -hmm. touch between men so they used it as, as to train people to talk about relationships and talk, talk about trust and the intimacy and those kind of things so he set up them some retreats the weekend i think it's quite a nice uh, rustic place in the somewhere in mid wales or like a very rural area and it's quite often they use it for those retreats and he started to think how could he develop this further and he thought well one way might be to work with other therapists because they have their continued professional development cpd mm -hmm. the cpd here is that every year they're going to have so, so many hours of further training in the, in the uk at least mm -hmm. and he so he's worked with fellow therapists and counselors as well and um, looking at how martial arts training might help them look reflect on the, what the nature of being a therapist or a counselor is for example with trust about relationships again the relationship was stressed a lot and he started to open workshops out to the wider public. Um, these might be people who are just interested. They might be people referred by the, some of these professionals, actually, who are, are maybe undergoing some counselling or therapy. And it's often about um, you know, trust, rapport, um, confidence, um, making eye contact. So small things like, you know, we might see small things, but for them it's a big thing, like maybe able to see face-to-face, -face, um, meet new people, um, maybe have a, be able to trust someone with touching them or be able to feel confident, be able to throw a punch or whatever it is or avoid something so we we work usually um, beginning it was a bit exploratory really just trying things out and it started with um, the martial art of sistema mm -hmm. sistema is a russian martial arts so you might know that was using the russian special forces and soviet union and it's generally looking at it's mainly like a close combat system not so much a sport it's more about self-defense and self-protection really survival and um, because one of um Stephen's advisors is called Jeff Farris. He was originally from South Africa, but he's based down in Wales as well. He's a psychotherapist and a martial artist who's lots of experience, different styles. And he's um, gone to Russia quite a few times. He's learned Systema and he's an instructor. So he used Systema to look at, in many ways, survival psychology, because that's his specialism. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, how we deal with emergency situations and the reflexes, how we, our body shuts down. Mm -hmm. And he likens this to people living maybe with trauma and anxiety or what happened you had a bad ex a traumatic experience and then your body's shutting down and not working and it's been triggered by something and for him system is almost like a, a key that we can turn on other nervous system to overcome this often through the breath control of the breath so we used some workshops with system right in many ways i was a student just observing taking part and then i had, I had an opportunity to help with uh, wing chun with confidence building so i had one workshop again with general public in which we i taught them how to stand how to present you know good posture you know and then a lot of chinese martial arts focus on standing mm -hmm. basic exercises standing and then we did moving exercises together to get them to move like wing, walking like wing chun and yeah i think they, it went well i got some very good feedback and um and then we've had some other ones planned like hemo historical european martial arts with self-concept so mm -hmm. using some of the weapons again getting them to get used to using something new a new cool kind of skill but maybe even getting used to some of them if they feel comfortable being confident enough to deal with this and then developing a new concept to themselves. So we had lots of um, things lined up. It's just the issue of the pandemic sadly hit us mm -hmm. and uh, financially. And, and I mean, I wouldn't want to talk for Stephen, but from my understanding, it's just uh, maybe, it, and it, like many martial arts, if you, even if you want to start school, it, it is a big financial burden mm -hmm. and time, isn't it? We you know you spend marketing, advertising, but at the same time, you've got your day job. So his day job is a therapist and counsellor in two different cities. And, and I think the moment we're on hold just because it's it's based around him, really, I wouldn't want to push it. But, but overall, I think it's, a, it's been a great um, one. So if I, we have a, web, a website, you can see what we do. And some, some there are some anonymized photographs. Of, you, I think the only person here, you can see me like twirling against the wall or something. But you can see what <laughs> kind of things we do, like <laughs> the learning system and a bit of wing trend. So... Please do get in touch with us and then like maybe we can set some up some events up or discussions online. At the moment I'm writing about these kind of topics and range of what things I've learned about the therapies and it's a fascinating topic. What how martial arts can reach out to people who may not normally do a martial arts, but they're doing something that's specialized for a problem. So mm -hmm. the confidence or esteem or anxiety or, or depression and back we're going back trying to battle or work with a problem, should we say living with it and working on it i don't know much about wing chun uh but is it possible for us to go through some of the upper body elements of how you stand while sitting and perhaps for listeners to go through that is that is that something we could try 
Okay, we could, we could try, yeah. Yeah, so like a lot of um, Chinese martial arts, we work on standing, but we also work on sitting, so that'd be quite interesting. Uh, so the idea here, the, the crown points, you might think at the top of your head that mm-hmm. you can try to extend up. But by doing that, often we put our tongue on the roof of the mouth, mm-hmm. okay, and you push slightly up. It's a gentle push, and then you start, that starts to tuck your chin in, mm-hmm. okay? So you might have a little bit of a softer hand to your chin, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. And then you try to lower your shoulder, that's it. And keep your shoulders nice and sunk. So you don't want to raise any one of your shoulders. Try to see if they're even. And normally we have our hands open like you've got your hands parallel to your elbows. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you pull back with the fists. So the fist is again parallel to your chest area. Mm-hmm. Maybe around the nipple kind of height. Mm-hmm. Um, elbows maybe slightly outwards, but not excessively. Mm-hmm. So if you were to extend your arms forwards, it would sort of form a triangle. Mm-hmm. and point, it's pointing the fingers together so mm-hmm. we go back here and then what we do is we try to extend the spine but not excessively um, normally we would drop we say the tailbone when you're standing but you can't quite do that when you're sitting and then that would be the position really you try to, to look for areas of tension to relax the chest um, and it, it really sets up the structure of the systems of the angles and um, so for the punch or to hold the centre line basically um, yeah, and that would be what you can do. So this is really good for your posture, obviously, because you, um, if you're working with a computer, you're quite mm. good to hold your shoulders back. So you're trying to drop your scapula, um, open up the back, um, use a bit more of the, the lats and the side. And you're stretching, you're trying to create space around the ribs. Okay, so that's one way of looking at Wing Chun. And then you could do lots of different exercises from here. So you could practice, for example, the basic guard, which you... For example, you can put the left hand in front of the right, so you might notice I'm forming a triangle. So the idea here, we do with an exercise, we do a trust exercise where, where, where to punch you, you should be able to deflect this through the triangle. So the idea is that it's not quite crossed over, but the one hand's in front of the other, or like just one behind the other. Okay. And you can practice switching over the top. So you do small circles where your right hand goes circles over your left, and then, so what happens is the front hand drops underneath, the back hand goes forwards. Mm-hmm. Okay, very small motions and very subtle. And eventually, you just and you drive this from the elbow. So in Wing Chun, you start to think of the elbows rather than the hands. So even though people think of the hands, this helps give you structure and helps you form the line. Okay, and from if we go back to the where we put our fists to the sides, mm-hmm. you can also do things like bring the triangle forwards. So you then bring the left. Usually, we start with the left hand in front. It's just everyone does the same thing. And then you pull back again to the ribs. Then you go forward to the right. Okay. And pull back. And we might then do it over the top. So you, this might be when someone's grabbing you and you, you bridge down. So you, you can go over the top, down. So it's a semicircle going downwards, basically, presenting that triangle. Pull back and then to the right. Okay. That's it. Yeah. So there are different ways of doing the triangle, depending on where, where the opponent in the real life it might be underneath, because someone might be like this. So you go underneath and take the center. So that's essentially it. I know it's hard. It's really good a really good challenge for me to do it. So hopefully the listeners can understand a few things. Um, yeah, I, can, yeah. I think so. I think so. It's, um, so I grew up doing Kyokushin karate. And so this is very much like the kind of Gyakuski, like, which is the reverse punch, but two, yeah. you know, but there yeah. are times where you're doing things like abuki breathing, where you do breathe in with two fists like this and push out. And I do think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to think about which of your shoulders is higher than the other. Where are your hands in relation to your chest? Which muscles in your back can you feel working to hold that posture? What happens to your head if you try and make yourself as tall as possible, which, you you know, Pilates probably borrowed from martial arts, given that martial arts came first. Uh, (laughs) And it's a wonderful opportunity to practice interoception, right, to practice noticing what is happening on the inside of the body and not just as as a way to strengthen the back muscles to oppose the overuse of the internal rotation of the shoulders or that, you know, classic desk worker posture that everybody can can probably bring to mind, uh, but also to take a break from having your attention 
out either at your work or in the past and the future and to bring it back into the body as an anchor for the here and now I think is just such a wonderful tool for people to be able to use so thank you thank you oh, well wonderfully put I must say it's a very nice expression you said <laughs> it's a good summary to put inside our body definitely to go back into our bodies because as you said we're all thinking outside a lot more now with social media and the news there's so many notifications on your phone I mean I was worried Earlier, I did move my iPad to the other rooms and I turned my email off so I could totally focus on you. And then, but there's always things out, outside and there's more people, more traffic, the population is increasing, the world's more complex. So we need, yeah, thinking back into ourselves, like, you know, the ideas of martial arts and mindfulness. Obviously, as, as we mentioned in the event we had with um, trauma informed martial arts, I mean, you could argue that the standing posture in many ways is an element of mindfulness in many martial arts, you know, looking at your breathing, looking at the relaxing certain muscles dropping scapula checking for it you know balance internally and you could do that for a long long time and in, in tai chi we do that a lot a lot as well i you know holding the the ball the zhang zhang zhong uh, or, or the different stances often i do that whilst watching the t- tv or films so you can draw a mark you can you can use martial arts things rather than sitting on the sofa you can try to just ground into your body and then um, yeah it's, uh, you can do it anytime I, what's another thing about martial arts i like is that it doesn't often require that much equipment. There's some things like HEMA, for example, historical European martial arts and kendo and things, they do require you buying certain equipment, but a lot of martial arts, there's still things you can do with it, footwork exercises, stances, turns, practicing evasive maneuvers. You could do that in a hotel room. So if you're traveling or somewhere or anywhere, really, you don't need that much space and there's always something to do in martial arts. So yeah, so that's what I love about it really. So it keeps me busy. So your research has focused a lot on how martial arts could be a vehicle for improving health. Um, we already touched upon how the fact that you are training in a martial art might make you more motivated to make healthy food choices or perhaps engage in additional cardiovascular training or strength training to improve your martial arts skills. What are the other ways that martial arts can improve our health? Okay. I think one thing about martial arts is that then they're typically seen as um, lifelong practices or long-term art or de- development arts. So mm-hmm. you think of an art, I also, I'm recently thinking about martial arts as art. Mm-hmm. It's got to have a longevity aspect to it because you know art, like painting, you shouldn't have to stop painting when you're 35 or 40. Mm-hmm. Now I know sporting careers are extending, but um, to 40 say, or, you know, we see some people into the late thirties playing and, in tennis and, and in, in boxing but the idea of martial arts i think shouldn't necessarily have a retirement period so if you don't retire you want to sustain something and do something very well set a good example when you're older and, and share things with different generations because martial arts can be very intergenerational mm-hmm. i think you want to be a healthy person make healthy choices as much as far as possible because you can you know we still can catch a cold or have a cough or there's still risk of us Sadly, you know, catching COVID or something. I'm not saying we're invulnerable, mm. but we want to make good lifestyle choices, not to be, say, addicted to sugar or addicted to other things, but still be balanced, not to be too obsessive. So there's, a, there's a, again, that's spectrum of discipline. You don't want to be overly disciplined because that can be an obsessive, compulsive kind of behavior or, mm-hmm. you know, very controlled and, and create tension, internal tension and conflict. Um, but you don't want to go off, you know, too, too lax and chilled out. So, I think martial arts give you that. You need to be able, you want to sustain your practice, really. That's one element. Um, I think another one, is, again, is the variety of things. So that you've got the practice that might work more on your cardio, more on your reflexes, more. There are some exercises that are a little bit more internal, like visualization exercises. So I think the martial arts give a great variety that um, if you do take all these things, you'll probably be very balanced and say your physique, for example. So you might do exercise on one leg. It might be exercise on the ground. So you work in different muscles, different groups. And yeah, and all, all the different parts of your body may you often forget. So I think there's a great variety compared with a lot of other um, sports where there is a overly specialized movements. Um, maybe on one side, like you're a bowler in cricket. Oh, I'm really bad at cricket. So I know you're Australian as well. So very conscious of my bad technique. You, know, you might be doing certain things and maybe you're, you're really good on one side, but perhaps you're not good on the other. Whereas martial arts are trying to hopefully balance the person out, a balanced, holistic person. That's another way of a lot of writers have talked about the mind-body connection, but also within this, you are balanced, uh, left and right, um, forward and back. So you can go forward, you can go backwards, you can go different angles. And I think that's what we're always striving to 
to move for perfection. So this we're never going to get perfection. But most masters talk about this this drive, this the pursuit of mastery of perfection, and that's probably what we do. And if you do follow that kind of lifestyle, you want to be a perfect human being or a perfect martial artist. You probably will generally be healthy person. And of course, health can be dictated by the philosophy of what, or definitions of health. But I think, according to most definitions, you probably would be. You know, you mentally, physically, you want to use the World Health Organization's definition. You know, physically, you're probably going to be very active, meeting all of the expectations. Mentally, you're going to be taking out aggression, stress, expressing your emotions in a, in a positive way. And socially, you're going to meet, as you said, meet new people, try, your ability to travel and be able to open up to people, talk to them. I think that's really important. So that that's there. And then you might look at other alternative philosophies of health, like the mindfulness element, the meditative elements. I think that you can go deep into that element if you wanted to. Um, and then you might have other benefits that still be understudied. So I don't know if that helps answer your question, but it's... That's excellent. Yeah. No, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. It yeah. kind of makes me wonder, and I don't know whether we will ever have an answer to a question like this, but how much of that result was the or is the result of deliberate planning so the thing that comes to my mind is judo and I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with the history of judo but and, and I probably don't do it perfect justice but quite broadly uh, at a time where Japan was really quite transitional where they were starting to adopt a lot of modern practices um, and moving away from a lot of their traditional ways of living there was and I'm going to forget the name, I'll put it in the show notes, there was one man who wanted to create a martial arts system that would continue the traditional way of Japanese living and also form the basis of physical education that taught students how to be essentially good people. Um, and that was judo. Yeah. Uh, at the the you know time where everyone was practicing sort of different versions of jujitsu, and then judo really evolved to become a sport because of the Olympics and lots of other things. But certainly, he sat down and said, "Okay, if I could create a combat sport, a martial art that would teach people the kind of things that they would need to be a good person, this is what I would put into it." And do you think that a lot of martial arts are designed that way, or it's just that? They were designed and then we're now realizing all these things and it's a coincidence. If you if you understand my question, I don't know if there yeah. is an answer. It's a great um, question. I thought I'm it's timely because I'm trying to write about different uh, definitions of martial arts or my own working definition at the moment is it's fairly open, but I say it's an um, an imaginative, adaptable system of human physical fighting techniques designed to deal with problems in combat and society. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. If you look at that design, you mentioned the word design. So definitely there's a design element and there's a problem and it's based on the society in question. So judo wouldn't have existed in feudal Japan because they were always at war, you know, the different shoguns and the, the different kingdoms and rule, you know, if you say lords, daimyo, and um, obviously they were, had more weapons. So with the changing and modernization of Japan and the sort of banning of the katana as a we holding the katana and armor and all these things judo is now thinking of a, a globalized world deals with the problems society society needs to be made japanese more open more connected and there's also there's still an element of a problem in combat the combat is the element of being thrown and being grappling and and, and realistic elements of self-defense as well in an unarmed way so and it's imaginative it's imagine it's in someone's imagination because uh, jiguro kano mm. is the founder he had obviously a vision because he had experience, he had previous previous experience of martial arts because always martial arts are founded by martial artists they always come from something but they come from also someone's imagination and how they can adapt techniques they may be sometimes inventing new techniques but generally adapting what already exists but for a new purpose because of a new certain perceived problems we say I should have highlighted the word perceived problems because they're perceived by the founder or perceived by some people around them, not by everyone, maybe. Maybe others are unaware of this problem that they don't see, they're just getting on with their daily lives. So they might not think of this problem in combat because very few people might have the vision to um, perceive something different. Mm -hmm. But that's why they found it was very interesting and special people. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I would agree that, but other martial arts, 
probably do they are adapting to that different purposes so i think that the the voodoo arts you might think of the japanese voodoo arts um have, have all those anything with a dough at the end mm-hmm. uh, aikido etc judo uh, maybe karate do so you think of karate do in japan japanese forms of karate but shudokan karate generally looks at this development of the, the character the moral cultivation of certain values and mm-hmm. as well as self-defense um but of course we know that it's always adaptable so it has changed to a sport where now we know that karate is going to the Olympics as, as judo has. So if, if Kano looked at um, judo now, he might be a bit surprised by certain things, maybe like, um, for example, becoming an Olympic sport, we have the weight categories. So I think he initially would, would be against uh, and the weight cutting. So there is a back to the dark side of martial arts. So mm-hmm. it, it's often out of the control of the founders. They have really good intentions at the beginning, probably. And I think he, judo can be used for cultivation of character and education, but probably now, a lot of judo is going into a sport and with that comes maybe lots of competition, lots of weight changes. And maybe now MMA, people can do judo and MMA. So one of my PhD students, Dan, Daniel Jacklin, he's a judo himself and his dad's a judo coach. And, and he's mentioning how, you know, he's seen a 15 year old do lots of like diuretics and so teenagers doing weight cutting to get into a competition and then being a bit dizzy, but managed to, to win, but obviously potentially damaging their long-term health. So, so yes, judo can be brilliant because it can give you that respect and certain etiquette and all these kind of, and, and then they value J- Japanese culture, etc. But maybe a lot of the Japanese elements have been removed over time, not by one individual, but just just because of the industry, because of the nature of sports, the nature of globalization, is that maybe Japanese elements maybe are weakened over time, especially in, in the Western context. So yeah, that, that over, genera- over generations is, is going to change. Um, but I'd agree that martial arts can be used for education. And a lot of, um, in fact, UNESCO are quite interested in that now because of, um, they have a group called the ICM, International Centre of Martial Arts. I don't know if you've heard of them based in South Korea. So I can send you the link later because they have websites and lots of publications these days. And they're really interested in mar- uh, quality martial arts education. So possibly as a result of thinking of what, how martial arts diversified, possibly strayed a little bit from the original path. And then they might think, how can they work with the young people, the youth of today, and use martial arts as a way to educate them, particularly in relation to values, to values-based education. Mm-hmm. So there are initiatives to continue the, these trends, basically. Yeah, so that's a complex answer to a great question. <laughs> a complex question for sure. And yeah, I, yeah. And I yes. do love that people are thinking about that because, like I said, I think that the the sports that are the combat sports that are most prevalent in the media, boxing, kickboxing, uh, MMA, so therefore Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, wrestling, the the really quite um, hard martial arts as opposed to the soft martial arts, but even you know, some of the hard martial arts are quite um, philosophic and they are quite values-based. Kyokushin Karate is a great example of that. It's quite a hard style but has a, quite a lengthy dojo kun, like an oath, which is riddled with riddles, uh, which are designed to prompt thought about the self and the interaction with others and, you know, the, the martial way, whatever that means for you. But I think that that is missing from from a lot of martial arts and for better or worse, you know, not everyone necessarily wants that. And I don't think it's fair to push onto people, you know, if you're training a combat sport, then you need to learn all of these values. Some people really just are there because they want to kick and punch and, and they want to hit pads. And so they're not as interested in standing in line and talking about concepts or reflecting on, you know, how the, this technique represents this different you know, respect or, or whatever it might be. But I, I, I love that people are thinking about how to integrate that because I think for me as a 12-year-old, you know, going through all my teenage years with a traditional martial art was really quite fantastic and uh, pruned my ego in a way that I don't know if it would have happened in a combat sport, although I think that uh, experience is quite a good ego crusher in of itself and that, you know, when you when you learn what is good and good, good and not good etiquette on the mat in terms of sparring with people, I think that does improve your ego. But I wonder, what do you see for the future of, of martial arts? Do you think we, 
we'll continue to see these more mainstream martial arts take over and then these kind of uh, values-based pedagogies die out or will they continue to a lesser extent or is there an, a, like a, a surge of those kind of martial arts growing? Like what do you see for the future of MAX, so martial arts and combat sports? Okay, it's great. It, brilliant question. It's a, I think hard, but I think, I believe that, yeah, definitely the sporting element will continue. Do you think about um, martial arts as a business and the way the world we the world essentially is a capitalist world mm-hmm. or system, and even country, communist countries like China are now buying into big business and and even MMA now they're being more open. So even China was initially was quite hesitant to MMA and UFC coming. Now they have ch- Chinese fighters going to the UFC and mm-hmm. clicking the women's divisions doing very well. Mm-hmm. So you've got this kind of that's going to continue happening. At the same time, I know that some. Um, groups are trying to um, almost motion capture some traditional styles like especially in the Chinese martial arts and some perhaps some esoteric form of kung fu which is only has one more teacher left in the world they're capturing some of them there are some mo- kind of ideas that, okay if they die out we can reinvent them so I think there's going to be lots of more reinvention um, programs so like, like in, in historical European martial arts but maybe with Eastern martial arts and other start, African martial arts maybe in other systems that we there's evidence that they existed and maybe there's kind of a resurgence of interest so I think those revivalist movements are going to continue and I think the um, moral education programs will continue but they probably be um, helped a lot by groups like the ICM UNESCO and other groups which really are trying to develop um, webinars the moment they're developing kind of te- uh, coach training coach training for inclusivity as well so there's lots of they're going to obviously add the idea of inclusivity that maybe wasn't necessarily central to the original idea say budo and other martial arts because they may have just been thinking of people who are quite general but maybe not about people with disabilities or possibly not so much about women even though they did teach some women so there's they're going to be more consideration of gender balance gender identities, religions, et cetera. So I think inclusivity is probably a big thing for the future in martial arts, I think, I believe. So that a lot of research is thinking about how men and women train together or boys and girls and or um, maybe different sexualities, et cetera. And now I think in the 21st century, that's probably the next push, next big move, as well as the revivalist movements, because people are interested in their own heritage or what was done before. And that links back to the imaginative kind of fan- fantasy element of martial arts, because a lot of martial arts is spurred by video games and TV series and a lot of people got into it from that I think that as they, those things still continue to come out through comic books etc people will have that amazing thing I want to do martial arts because they're cool and I want to find out what the, the knights fought like this so I think they will continue so those probably be the I think that will happen so I don't think any martial arts necessarily will some martial arts will die out because they can um, the UNESCO ICM are interested in martial arts heritage at the moment they're writing a preliminary report it only has 300 martial arts. I'm, I'm one of the reviewers, but quite privileged to be in that project. But um, they're, they're dividing it per continent and they're looking at certain ones. So the moment I'm on it, and you can imagine Asian martial arts is a long list. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of martial arts. Some of them, there's only a few sentences about them because we know very few, few things. So I think another thing element of martial arts will be a lot more research, a lot of people going out there into the field, particularly post-COVID, observing, taking photos, maybe videos, and trying to find out more about them. To at least document what they are and we, we not, can't necessarily preserve everything but we can at least try to document and understand and appreciate them what they might have in common and maybe there may be ways to preserve and have discussions between similar styles and um, in that way they may be they may actually have longer life in them for future generations so okay, yeah, so i think that's probably yeah, yeah it's thank awesome you. it's really really interesting to think about and like i'm not biased either way like i've participate in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which arguably doesn't have a very, could make some enemies here, but arguably doesn't have a very strong grounding in like a culture. And and that owes a lot to the speed at which that it grew at and nobody really put a lot of thought into it. It was just sort of all of a sudden took off. And, of course, like the Gracie family had a lot to do with that, but other families and other lineages were were also present and, and sort of had had input there, but really when the IBJJF was formed, they borrowed a lot from other Japanese martial arts in order to achieve that. And so they don't really have their own Mm. traditions embedded. There's some other martial art traditions embedded, which I think has merit on its own. But, you know, and I've, of course, done Muay Thai, which has a lot of Thai tradition through it and, like, the Y crew and things like that, I think are quite beautiful to have 
preserved and that are still done and, and obviously types of karate, uh, which I think, you know, at, at some point there are traditions and culture embedded in all martial arts, just probably some more than others. And, and it's great because different levels of that are going to appeal to different people. Everybody's coming to martial arts for a different reason or, you know, some people have similar reasons, but everyone has their own reason. And I think that's really cool. And it's really cool that we are learning so much about history, that people are interested in getting interested in history because of martial arts. You know, it's quite mm-hmm. like we said earlier about how people are suddenly interested in eating healthily or going to do running or something like like that because they know it's going to improve their martial arts Well, people are interested in learning the history of a particular culture because they train in the martial art and they want to respect that and like isn't that wonderful and doesn't that get people interested in great things for their brain and isn't that great that we get to preserve all these wonderful histories so yeah I, I'm very much like you I think that I will spend my whole life being fascinated by by martial arts yes Definitely, it's an endless journey because you can definitely look into language as well. You can look at, so if you're interested in another culture, maybe the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you might end up learning Port- uh, Brazilian Portuguese to be able to travel to Brazil and then um, make friends there and develop friendships from that. And then you might think, oh, what's maybe missing in the system and or maybe something you could develop. Maybe there might be a more philosophical side from judo that maybe could be imbe- re-embedded into that system. So that's another kind of project for us. People actually create almost life projects of, doing something with their martial arts, to their martial arts um, from that. So definitely human, it might be just personal development, but they might actually want to do something to the arts, which, which will create, again, back to new lineages, new organisations. So you might say, okay, you work with Georgia Vary, or she, she adds something about the moral education, or she adds some kind of therapeutic elements, and then maybe someone down the road has done something else with the same art. And that's why it's back to the art. They're artists in the way that they create their own that special touch to it. Um, what else would you like to talk to everyone about? Is there anything about your research that's coming up? Do you want to promote anything about getting participants into anything, having a platform of martial artists to speak to? Oh, okay, thanks. Um, maybe at the moment um, I'm writing well, a book about the reconstruction of the martial arts, particularly in the Western context, so that hopefully will come out next year, but I need to knuckle down and <laughs> to write about it. Um, but essentially be looking at, different projects like for example therapy, martial arts therapies and be looking at revivalist martial arts and have martial arts be reconstructed so these are things i'll be working on the next few years but in terms of participants it'd be great to have um because that's more document-based research really basically in the public sphere but i would like, love to hear about people's stories and experiences about humor in the martial arts because um professor paul bowman of cardiff uni um, and i and then Paul, you might, people might know from the Martial Arts Studies Network, so he's quite well known in martial arts research. Um, both of us are interested in humour. He's a bit more interested in possibly, well, he has been interested in the, the media side and like how the media depicts martial artists, often in funny ways, like through adverts, etc. And I'm a little bit more interested in on the ground and how it's been used in, in the field. And, but we're also, he's also interested in that. So we've we developed, um, co-developed a questionnaire based on certain themes. So the themes are about like, Cute jokes about yourself. So often martial artists joke about themselves, like the instructors might make, make funny jokes. Um, jokes between each other, like often with in members, like fellow members joking about giving nicknames, etc. Um, and then it'd be jokes, for example, about your own martial art, like how funny or ridiculous we look, or all those kind of things. So, and maybe jokes about other styles of your own, maybe your own martial art, maybe rival schools. Um, mm-hmm. Other systems, often they, martial arts often build their identities. For, we've noticed might mean all the time, but joking about certain martial arts that maybe they don't think work or they're a bit silly or unrealistic. And those, those kind of levels, really. So we're looking at different dimensions of humour. So uh, we're hopefully trialling this uh, questionnaire and George has kindly helped me with that and a few other colleagues. And we would probably be doing that from in the autumn kind of period. So from like October to Christmas time, we'll probably be pushing the questionnaire out around the world. So if you would like to get in touch and I can, I can send you the question, the link to the, the survey, uh, you can email me on them, um, gbjennings at cardiffmet.ac.uk. That's my email address. So you can email me, then I can add you to our mailing list, send you the link, and then be brilliant here. And it'd be all, all anonymous, by the way, so you wouldn't have need your name. You can change all the names of the clubs, so you don't need to worry about offending anybody or... Um, 
or, or your even also your classmates, your teacher, try and change everyone's names because we're more interested in the stories than the examples of the actual people. We're not going to police it or chase anyone. It's a really broader picture, really. So that'd be great to have more participants. And that'd be my first questionnaire-based survey, so it'd be quite a nice little experiment as well. So. Thanks. So exciting. Yeah, we'll put all the details yeah. for that in the show notes for this episode. And it's funny, like uh, uh, reading over the survey, like a lot of examples came to mind for me. My coaches use a lot of humour and I already knew, but it, it was fun. it was quite funny for me to think about just the extent to which that they do that. And like a classic example is we've got a brown belt. So very, very good, like excellent um, jujitsu practitioner who has not the world's biggest head but he has like quite a large head and our coach cannot go a session without making a joke about you know his big head and so Tim and Tiago who probably don't listen to this show but like they will laugh about this because everybody yeah. laughs about this and and there are so many jokes like that interwoven through our club that I think really do add to that that family kind of feel that we talk so much about in in martial arts so yeah I'm interested to read this paper once it is published in a, a year or so I assume yeah I think it'll take for a year or so but with the teaching and all the things we have probably most of the time I find I write more in the summer so now I'm writing more things and reviewing things and so you have all the enthusiasm in the summer to collect data and, and it, after a time of analysis it probably it'll probably come out next summer I think and, uh, yeah and the family it's a great point on the family actually because that's another topic I'm I've been interested in because a lot of martial arts overtly use the word family, like um, especially in the Chinese martial arts, they, I mentioned lineage, but also but some of them created by families. So that, and you might know the Gracie family and other arts. Uh, some of them were created and run by families and this, and then, then within the clubs, they have a sense of family, like a place being at home, home from home, really, where you've got the brothers and sisters and this kind of sibling like language. Um, and it's quite nice. And it's almost a utopian family, really, because it's like an imaginary, possibly more functional than many families <laughs> in the sense that you know generally people get on with the topic and we, we, we work things work um so it's a family we kind of choose to belong to rather than the family we're born in. not necessarily you have a bad family background but it's it can be quite nice to have an alter alternative i think and identity in that way so yeah it's a great a good a good example. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, is there any other platforms that you'd like to share that people can connect with you on, like on social media or anywhere like that? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I don't use social media that much, but I said Twitter would be good. You can see after my, my post things like events. And um, so you can get seen on um, this at um, Dr. GB Jennings. That's that's my twi Twitter handle. Um, and then maybe for, again, for email and maybe the fighting and spirit you might be interested in contacting Stephen. So you look at, yeah, so fightingandspirit.com. You can see what we've done over the last few years and get in, get in touch uh, with Stephen or myself at my email. And then, yeah, those are the events. And I, I hope to develop some events online for martial arts practitioners and, and try and develop my own little network. There are so many networks, but mainly geared towards linking researchers with practitioners and instructors. So that's something that's ongoing. I might even develop my own podcast. Like I think I'm inspired by people like you inviting me. So, so eventually, if you want to get in touch and be a, again a guest on my emerging, not even started yet <laughs> podcast, you're more than welcome. And Georgia also, it'd be great to have you. And then, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from anyone really just about martial arts and and as uh, academia and research gator. I don't know if you've heard of those websites, but academia.edu mm -hmm. is a place where I often I put my presentations and some of my draft work and things I can share, I'm allowed to share, and, and same with ResearchGate. Um, there are some PDFs that are open access. And um, so if you want to read some of my research that Georgia mentioned, um, you can access them there, really. So those are good good sites to learn about, read about martial arts research, because you can also search for key terms and find other people's work as well. For sure. Yeah, we'll put the details to all those in the show notes. And thank you so much for coming on, George. This has been an excellent conversation. And yeah, I love your enthusiasm for martial arts. Well, thank you. Same with you. Your energy is boundless and I'm impressed by what you've achieved. And, you know, such a young age, as we said in, in our events, I hope you really do continue because you've done so many great things so far for us and uh, looking forward to the next event that we have. And um, hopefully we can share what we, we're doing to the wider public soon. So that's great. Definitely. Uh, brilliant. Thanks. And thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Have you thought of something to be grateful for today? What was it? 
I'm grateful for the amazing women that train with me at the Fight Back Project. I'm grateful for Nari and the beautiful song Shape Me, which is heard at the beginning and end of every episode. And I'm grateful for you for listening to this show and helping martial arts keep saving lives. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you'd like to like and subscribe, oh, that's a bonus. I'm famous. I'm here shedding shells. I'm shameless. Having nothing, no complacence. Walk to many tight ropes with no hope. So I became this poster. They hold over all the heads of trauma holders. You don't need to know my history. I move boulders. Atlas shrug, cause I lifted the weight above his shoulders. No pretense of defense. Move first like chess soldiers. This goes deeper than empowerment, cause huh, I'm the one that power it. Physical meets mental challenge me to keep devouring. If I can't change the scenery, at least I change perspectives. No longer isolated, but elevated and selective. Darkest places become beautiful spaces. This is where rage meets patience, meets power, meets gracious, meets. We're so glad you came in. The feeling is contagious. When you the walking impact of intended bad intentions. When you the manifesting of collecting all they tensions. You the soul and body hold it all and still remember. But I'm a work in progress, testament to all contenders. Forgot what it was like to have control over self. Forgot what it was like to be the one in charge. Forgot in my reflection I could see all my wealth. Forgot that with my bare hands I break all these bars, barriers and obstacles. They can't cage me. They can't chronicle all my experiences and reduce them to appearances. When I was truly beaten, gave myself clearances to fall down, mess up, and get myself back up. I'm not looking for clovers because I don't believe in luck. Damn, you were badass. I heard them say it clearly. Why, thank you very much. I know now I'm not weary of what's next for me because I expect to see growth like I was planted, watered, fed, and bloomed to be the positivity and accountability. No one they won't step if I'm the agent of my agency. I think I found my voice again, huh? I think I found my voice again, huh? I'm not sorry, I'm not sorry, you're the end where I begin. Boundaries, I know them well. Take a breath and meditate. Who is she? I know her well. Now I get to open gates. One, two, one, two. I don't need your permission. And if you get uncomfortable, then use your intuition to know that I won't stay where respect is ever missing. And everything I do, that's me making decisions. It's truly underrated, the value of self-worth. Forgot that I was rich from the moment of my birth. A penny for my thoughts, no really, you can't afford it. You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it. You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it, huh?